The following program is presented with closed captioning available. This is a service of Maricopa College's television, channel 115. Hello and welcome to The Director's Cut. I'm your host, Sheila Boren. The Director's Cut features film and video work created by students enrolled in Maricopa Community Colleges. The film school at Scottsdale Community College includes TV studio production classes where students collaborate to produce TV talk shows. On a recent show, Heather Murphy explains the tragic circumstances of India's rural farmers. Inspired by their courage, she set up a foundation to provide microloans as well as vocational training to impoverished families. She shares some remarkable success stories as she recounts her experience among these people. Let's watch. Hello and welcome to Arizona Express. I'm your host, Marcelo Dietrich. My guest today is Heather Murphy, who arranges microloans to widows in India. Welcome to the show, Heather. Thank you. Now tell us, Heather, what was your motivation for starting this organization? This organization started as my college thesis. I was an accounting and finance major at Arizona State University, and I created a business plan, you know, of best practices for nonprofits that do microfinance. But the passion for this project started freshman year. I had a friend whose father passed away, and his mother had a lot of trouble finding a loan to support her three boys when she was starting a new business. I started doing some research and trying to find her help, and then stumbled across an article about Indian widows. There's a lot of India, Indians who are committing suicide, um, they're farmers, and they're committing suicide because they can't repay the debt that they owe the banks. Maybe because they purchased seed and the crop failed, or they purchased business machinery and their business went under. And and because debt is inherited through the male line, they commit suicide to have their debt forgiven, but they're leaving behind women and children who can't support themselves. Now, what is the name of your organization? Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative. We call it WE, W-E-I. And our website is WeCreateChange.org, W-E-I, Create Change. Now, what does your organization do? We provide four main services to villages in India. We provide vocational training, microloans, voter registration and community meetings. So we train women in a vocational field of their choice. We arrange apprenticeships and we fund that training. Then we provide them with microloans for business assets. We purchase the assets for them to start their business and as they become pro re profitable they repay us. We also register all of our program participants to vote because it's very important to us that our women are decision makers in their community. Entrepreneurs set an example for higher achievement for other women. And we also bring groups of women together to have a safe environment to share business practices, life stories, anything that they feel comfortable sharing with one another. You, you had mentioned uh, vocational training. What kind of uh, vocational training do you offer? We really offer vocational training in any area that they show interest. We can arrange apprenticeships with anyone in the village or even outside that village if necessary. Um, for example, projects that we've done are jewelry projects. They hand make these sandalwood bracelets and hand paint them. We also provide a tailoring school in one of the villages and they make saris such as this one. We've done candle making projects that are sold all over the United States and within India. And there's a lot of women who are interested in traditionally male-dominated fields. We'll train them in refrigeration repair, bicycle repair, really anything of their choice. Now, you uh, said you give them loans. Now, what are, these, what are the loans used for, if you could elaborate on that? We purchase business assets. We do not actually hand money over to anyone because it ensures that there won't be a misappropriation of any assets. We believe that by purchasing those assets for them, there's no trials or tribulations and actually spending that money for that they may not have enough food to eat that day or want to put their children through school and we don't want them to have the burden of taking that money and then being unable to repay it so really we give them the freedom to run their own business without having any difficulty repaying that okay now i understand that uh you went to india spent some time there yes and you brought video for us yes that we're gonna roll and you're going to talk to this is from my trip in April and May of this year. This is a typical Indian village. They're living on less than a dollar a day. 
As you can see, the houses are made from natural elements, sticks, mud, dung, anything they can find. And of course, we'll see the cows wandering through the streets. We're coming up on a community meeting of men on the sidewalk, maybe a village council, maybe they're changing something. This is a government water truck bringing water to a tribal village that's nine kilometers outside of town. They carry the water one mile up the hill to their house, and that is the only water that they have for a week. There's no in-between. Um, here we have some children who are really interested in the camera, a boy holding his little brother for us, and there's going to be a little girl showing us her brother watching from afar. They were really interested in the technology they had never seen. These are children bringing water up to their schoolhouse. And as you can see, there's always time for play. Now, it's in villages like this that you have met these women that you work with. Talk about some of the women you've worked with. I've heard many touching stories in my time in India. Um, I lived there three months last year and met with over 500 widows in our meetings. One woman who really, really touched me was a woman in one of our smaller village meetings in Maharashtra, which is a state in India. And she shared a story about her husband's suicide. He had killed their oldest daughter prior to committing suicide and also threw kerosene on her and lit her on fire prior to his suicide. And when she stood up, you could see that she was that traditional dark South Indian, but she had many white spots that scarred her face, her arms, and her stomach. It was very, very touching and courageous of her to share her story. And this is why I do what I do. This is where my passion comes from. Now, this this organization that you have passion for, what, um, how do you differ from other microfinancing organizations? We pride ourselves on being different. We're really a social organization. We're making a difference in these women's lives. We're not earning interest off of them. There's a big um, focus on social responsible investing where people can earn some interest off of this. There's nothing wrong with that, but we feel that the lowest interest possible is what's necessary. Some villages, we don't charge interest. Some we do because they can handle it with the time value of money. Um, but we really, really, our focus is the women. We do not want to put an, a burden on them. We really want them to be able to get up outside of this daily wage life that they live and support their children. Now, recently in the media, a lot of microfinancing companies have been getting a bad rap. What do you say to these critics? I think people really need to do their due diligence. They need to do their research, where they're donating, where they're investing, how people are being affected by it. Um, I myself have had stories shared with me when I'm over in India about loan sharks coming after people, physically harming their families. And so it's very near and dear to my heart that people are making a difference and not just earning money off of these women. Now explain to the viewers the difference that this money that you provide offers. When people are living on a dollar a day, a hundred dollars could help a hundred people survive. We purchase sewing machines, a table, cloth, all the thread and supplies necessary for under a hundred dollars. And these women are, you know, given a job to support their families, their children, their parents, their in-laws. And their biggest goal is actually not for themselves. It's for their children to attain higher education and to really move up and out of that daily wage society. So these women are setting examples within their home and outside in their villages and their states and their country and for the world to see. Mm -hmm. Now, again, the website is wecreatechange.org. W-E-I. W-E-I. <laughs> W-E-I. Wecreatechange.org. Uh, go to the website. There's um, some different fundraising devices that you can partake in with actual items from India. Um, now, that's all the time we have for today. If you would like to learn more about the work that Heather does, you can visit her website at, again, wecreatechange.org. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this edition of Arizona Express. I'm your host, Marcelo Dietrich. Thank you for watching. At the film school at SCC, there's a class in special effects called Introduction to Video Compositing and Title Animation. All students in this class create an animated ultra short video called a bumper. These serve as transitions between the award winning films which are screened at the annual film and video festival hosted by SCC. Let's take a look at a few of their creations.
I'm sure those entertaining animations took many hours of skillful work and imagination. Now we'll take a look at another talk show, this time from the Advanced TV Studio Production class, who chose Animanga as their subject. The Japanese word Animanga is derived from anime, meaning animation, and manga, which means flowing words. Another way of saying comic books and derivative animated films. This ancient art form, with its colorful and exotic characters, has a devoted cult-like following and is enjoyed by people of all ages. Let's take a look at an interview with an anime enthusiast, as well as some anime fans dressed as their favorite characters. Hello, and welcome to Animanga. I'm your host, Mark Lincheski. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Anthony Gruda, an anime enthusiast. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. Now, tell us a little bit about how you became involved with anime. Well, it all started when I was a kid. I was watching this show called Voltron, and uh, it was a show from Japan. I didn't know it at the time, and I was absolutely fascinated by it. I had never seen anything like it before. And it wasn't until about high school where I started to kind of learn more about anime and, and how a show like that came over from Japan. And then later on in college, I came in contact with the fan base that runs these local conventions. I was in Boston at, at the time. And that's kind of re really where I learned what anime was all about and what it was. Well, maybe for our benefit, you can explain really what anime is, because I assume our audience members have some preconceptions really about anime that maybe it's only just Japanese animation, but I, I would imagine it's much more than that. Well, it has changed over the years. I mean, anime is Japanese animated cartoons. Um, they came over from Japan a long time ago. Originally, they came over in the form of subtitled shows. Um, kids over here in America who know about them would take the shows from Japan, subtitle them, and distribute them to their friends. Did they always get the translations correct? No, uh, in, fact, in the very beginning the translations were, were terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, no one really understood Japanese the way they do now. So where, where is anime headed now? Uh, anime has actually come quite a long way. Uh, the stories have gotten a lot richer. The animation, uh, the technology involved in the animation has grown up quite a bit. Uh, they're using a lot of CG now, a lot of 2D CG hybrids, uh, full 3D. A lot of crossovers to video games and other merchandising. Uh, it's become its own kind of version of cinema in a way. And how many different styles of anime are there? There are a multitude of styles, ranging from everything from drama to comedy to horror to action. Uh, stories about love, stories about loss, stories about giant robots, stories about metaphysics. I mean, it really runs the gambit. And what's your favorite? Uh, my favorite in particular is kind of those psychological, metaphysical thrillers. Uh, one in particular, Neon Genesis Evangelion, I'm particularly excited about. <laughs> now, I, I've seen a lot of this anime that it has very recognizable characteristics to the drawing. One thing in particular are the larger, very round eyes that these characters have. What's, what's the logic behind that or the history behind that? Well, that was an influence that was actually from the Disney cartoons that first went across to Japan. Uh, they kind of saw that and integrated that into their art style, and it was kind of a commentary on Western culture. Um, the two different styles kind of me meshed together and created what we have now. It, it also has its very own characteristic voiceover style with the voice talent. Tell us a little bit about uh, the voiceover and how that's done. Well, here in America, the, the voice actors are actually a close-knit group. Most of them work out of Texas. There's a couple companies that do the actual voice dubbing. Um, there are many, many celebrities in their own right, really. Uh, one of the voice actors, Greg Aris, who was at a local convention of ours, uh, is very popular. And actually, fans will go out of their way to buy a show just because he is voicing a particular character. So really, the voice actors have kind of bring a lot to the show. Now, if it's a voice actor from Japan, they're almost considered godlike to the fans. Um, if you get a voice actor from Japan to come to your convention, your attendance automatically goes up. <laughs> I mean, they're very, very popular. Is it the same with the directors and the animators? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, there are 
a few key directors like Miyazaki, for instance, that are very sought after, that create a very specialized form of uh, Japanese animation, uh, very popular. Now, how would you describe Japanese animation compared to Western animation? Well, Western animation, it really, it actually, it really comes down to the story. Uh, what I found particularly captivating about Japanese animation was where they went with the stories, the point of view of the characters, um, the subject matter. And here in America, our animations, especially growing up, revolved mostly around toys like G.I. Joe or Transformers. Um, in Japan, they really, they were trying to focus in on telling a story in a cinematic style. Um, a lot of emotional motivation went into that, and there was a lot of art that was created around that. So it was, it was very different. You see a lot of the effects with, with the background moving behind the characters so quickly, and it oh. does seem more of an art form than uh, storytelling. Well, don't let that fool you. The, the speed lines, it was a clever way of cutting down on production costs. <laughs> Explain that. How well, how I mean, uh, animations, particularly cell animation, is very, very expensive. So they needed to find ways to cut down on the costs. So what they would do is they would run a background behind a character really quick because they didn't have to reanimate it. Wow. Well, uh, we have to take a quick break, but uh, before we do, we'd like to leave you with a shot of a, a special guest we have in the studio today. Uh, she is Ina, and she is drawing an actual anime caricature for us. And as we fade out to commercial, enjoy some of her drawing here. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Have you been a dad today? Welcome back to Animaga. I'm Mark Lincheski, and we're here with Anthony Gruda and a very special in-studio in guest, Ina, who is drawing some anime caricatures for us. Welcome to the studio, Ina. Thank you. Now tell us a little bit about what you're drawing here. Well, I'm drawing a character called Hope. It's one of Anthony's creations, and he told me the story one night, and I loved it so much that I wanted to actually do artwork for him for this, hopefully, to be produced show or manga soon. How many of his characters do you draw? Um, so far, we're just working on Hope. We're trying to get like the base of like what she's going to look like and her different forms and and basically her facial expressions and whatnot. And how long have you been drawing? I've been drawing since I was five. I've been drawing anime for about ten years, maybe a little longer than that. And do you have a favorite genre of anime that you like to draw for? Um, I tend more for the realistic style than more the cartoony looking. <clears throat> That seems to be the area that most anime is going towards is the realistic style of anime. Well, great. Well, thank you. Go ahead and, and keep drawing, and uh, we'll see how it progresses along here. Now, anime has really grown in popularity over the past several years, and uh, in particular here in Arizona. And uh, our special guest today, Anthony, has even organized a local convention. And, Anthony, could you tell us about the local conventions and how it's growing throughout the United States with other conventions? Uh, the, right now, there are two um, local conventions, um, Arizona and Phoenix Anime Fest. We're actually getting two more next year. One's called Otaku University, and one's uh, Yaoi Jamboree. Uh, Yaoi Jamboree is a little bit of a special kind of uh, animation convention. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Arizona actually started about three years ago. They're in their third year now. We had about 800 people for our first convention. And it kind of grew up from there. Um, ever since then, it's gone almost to the 2000 mark. Uh, we, our first year, we had a special Japanese guest who had never been to America before. Uh, this is actually some footage from this year. Uh, right there, we have one of the guests of honor, Kevin. And there's also Jodan. He was one of our cosplay guests of honor. This convention was held at the Mesa Convention Center on Easter weekend. Every year, Arizona happens on Easter weekend. We like to do it so that way uh, kids are out of school and they have that Friday free. Now, are there some celebrities here in these shots? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, actually, one's coming up. Uh, the voice actor I had mentioned before, Greg Arias, was a guest of honor this year. Uh, let's see if we get past a couple more people here. Oh, there he is on the right. He's wearing the uh, in and out hat. Big, <laughs> big hamburger fan.
uh, right there, they're actually uh, reviewing. They, uh, Greg and actually one of the DJs from DDR worked on an album this year. Uh, they were actually reviewing some of the tracks that they were going to play for the fans. This is the panel they did afterwards. And what are they discussing here? Uh, they were just kind of discussing how the production went. A lot of the guests of honor, they run a panel each day. And um, what they do is they talk about whatever products they've come out with or animes they voice acted this year. Um, kind of, it's a Q&A and a meet and greet with the fans. And are they, just, are they discussing the future of anime too? Oh yes, yes. Uh, future projects that are coming up, licenses that are coming out of Japan, who's the newest, hottest directors, who's the best artist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot right. of the voice actors are also fans too. Well, thank you very much for walking us through that. Now we have a very special introduction we'd like to make here in the studio. We have what are called cosplayers. And cosplayers are, it's short for costumed players. And these are people that go to these conventions or uh, to meetings or maybe just out on a Saturday night dressed as these characters from anime. And we have in the studio... Jonathan Fultz. Welcome, Jonathan. And tell us who you're dressed as tonight. I am dressed as Bash the Stampede from Trigun. Now, my particular costume happens to be a variant on his actual costume in the show. Ordinarily, he wears a red coat with yellow glasses, but I have red glasses and a black coat. Uh, also, in the show, he has spiky blonde hair, and but for this, I would normally have spiky silver hair. Okay, so a little creative license you've taken here, but you still resemble the character, and still people can recognize you as Vash the... Stampede. The Stampede, of course. Sorry about that. And you are? I'm Tiffany Kieft, um, cosplaying Sarah's Victoria, police girl from the Helsing anime. And who is this character? Uh, she was a police girl originally. She was turned into a vampire by the lead character, Alucard, and because of it, I'm... <laughs> Um, I'm just doing different things in the anime series. I'm killing mostly Nazi vampires from rooftops, uh, saving other soldiers, stuff like that. And this uh, monstrosity this is, of a gun you have here. It's a Harkonnen cannon. Um, it's used to kill Nazi vampires usually from a couple hundred yards radius. If not more, I can shoot up to five miles away with it. Does it have a recoil? Yes. I, you have to be <laughs> immortal to use it. Um, you have to be a vampire. No mortal can use it. If they do, they're shot about three walls back. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, thank you. And you are? Hi. My name is Johnny Carbo Jr. I am Mugen from Samurai Champloo. And Samurai Champloo takes place in Edo, Japan, where they combine feudal Jidai Geki samurai type films with urban hip hop culture. And so my character Mugen, he is a ronin, a masterless samurai, a vagabond. And he's just, as like, you know, the summary describes him violent buck wild but you know he's still a good person so he's your classic any hero did, he, did you choose him because you have the same characteristics are you buck wild <laughs> <laughs> not really i actually i'm a fan of samurai chompy because i'm a fan of hip-hop as well and it's very rare to find an anime with hip-hop soundtrack and everything and i really like his style basically his is like um just modified japanese clothing like this is basically a komodo just a very baggy mm -hmm. and everything these are modified hakima that are made into uh, shorts and everything. And, and normally he wears a uh, geta, the wooden shoes, but he doesn't wear. Like, he doesn't wear Nikes. No, no. no. Okay. But if he will, if he lived in a modern time, he probably will. Probably would. Okay. Now, and these, uh, these represent the tattoos because, as as said before, he's a vagabond. He's been in prison before, and his sword is basically a combination of a traditional Japanese katana with a uh, Persian design of the handle. His fighting style is basically combines feudal Japan with the hip hop culture. He uses like traditional Kenjutsu with B boying, also known as break dancing and mm -hmm. capoeira. So he's just all over the place and everything, swinging his sword, like windmill kicks and everything. So pop and lock and kick, right. your, kick your butt. <laughs> exactly. Kind of thing, right. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well yeah. I'd like to see all of you, if you don't mind, just striking a pose that your character would normally strike here for us for the camera. I'm gonna make some room here because I don't want to get hurt. But uh strike a pose Wow. There you have it. Live from the Anamaga Studios, characterizations. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about your, your gun that you have here. This Vash. is actually a very special gun. Uh, Vash's uh, brother actually made He made a second one. And what it is, is it's a customized revolver, but on the top clip, if you flip it open, there's actually a special kind of crystalline chamber. When that becomes unleashed, it actually transforms and melds with his hand to create what is known as an angel arm, basically like a 20-foot cannon that launches a, be a literal beam of immense power that in the show blows a hole through the moon, which the, sh the title of the show actually comes from the three guns that Vash happens to possess. The revolver, 
his angel arm that comes from the revolver, and his uh, prosthetic machine gun hand. Unfortunately, I don't have a real prosthetic. So. Uh, that's okay. But you know, through the miracle of modern science, and you know, maybe someday uh, we, we can maybe. help. <laughs> now, a little bit more about this gun. You know, tell us. You know, it's it's almost twice your height here. Um, the gun is actually shortened right now. The stock extends if I want it to. Of course. And she originally, she actually shoots it from the rooftops. Um, one bullet literally disintegrates a vampire. You have to aim for the heart area. Uh, the only time, she's actually really, really ditzy with it, unless she goes into blood rage or is told by her master, Alucard, to use it. Um, she's trained with it. Not very well. <laughs> and she has about two weeks training time with it. And does horribly the first time and actually depends on Alucard to kill a guy, but... I'm getting there. <laughs> now, now, does this your character have more than two weeks training with a katana? Well, his like um, his character has been all around, and uh, during that process, he's picked up many different fighting styles and everything. So his is like an anagram of all these all these fighting styles and everything, and it's just an interesting character, absolutely, and everything because he brings such like a foreign um, concept to you know your usual samurai films and everything. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you uh, to all three of you for joining us today. Wonderful costumes. Thank you. Great to see thank that you. kind of thing. Well, we'd like to thank you for watching the show, but before we leave, we have some information for you. If you'd like to get more information on anime, please visit AnnieRave, AnnieRave.com. <laughs> I'm your host, Mark Lincheski. I want to thank you all for watching this evening. Have a good night. Thank you for watching The Director's Cut. I'm your host, Sheila Boren. Tune in again for the next edition of The Director's Cut when you will see more exciting film and television work from the students at Maricopa Community Colleges.